So a very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all on behalf of GE Healthcare and Nepal Pediatric Society to webinar on HFO ventilation and closed loop O2 system. Our distinguished guests and speakers for today are Dr. Sanjay Vazir and Dr. Ramakrishna. So to start with, I'll just give an introduction of Dr. Sanjay Vazir. So Dr. Sanjay Vazir is a DM in neonatology. He is a director of NICU at Cloud9 Care Gurgaon. He has in his name 27 publications in various journals and books. He is an ex-president of IAP Neonatology Chapter. He is a former president of IAP Gurgaon. He is a former president of Haryana NNF. His areas of interest includes ventilation, nutrition, and ice care. About uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan, Dr. Ramakrishnan is working with SKS Hospital Postgraduate Medical Institute. He, he is pediatric and neonatology training in fellowship from UK. He is also in the pediatric cardiology fellowship, Evelmia Children, London. Ex-consultant neonatologist at St. George's King's College, London. He has set up a level three NICU human milk ba uh, bank at Women's Center, Coimbatore. He also has done research on and publications on NT-PRO and BNP and FPDA. His special interest includes functional echocardiography, non-invasive cardiac monitoring, neonatal nutrition, neonatal database, paperless NICU, and various others. That's he is master's on big data and artificial intelligence in neonatal medicine. So to ta start with the proceedings, I would like to welcome Dr. Sanjay Vajee to take a session on HFO ventilation. Dr. Sanjeevaji. So thank you everyone. And uh, it is uh, good and nice to be back in touch with the uh, colleagues in Nepal. I was recently, I think a few six months back in Kathmandu for some other session on uh, nutrition. So, I mean, I would have loved to be there again at this time and maybe holiday around but because of the corona, probably we are finding newer ways to communicate uh, while being at our home. So I was uh, given the opportunity to talk to you about the high frequency ventilation in newborns. And uh, uh, GE people said that we are probably the first uh, ventilator, the SLE, uh, which I've been using for the last 10 years. Uh, they have been supplied one recently, and uh, there are some baby tiger. 2,000 plus, 8,000 plus uh, ventilators, which are actually good for ventilating smaller, bigger babies, but not so great for, uh, oh, sorry, smaller babies, but not great for babies more than two kilos because they, they tend to f fail, uh, primarily because it works not on an oscillator principle, but on a different machine. But uh, my idea here to, would be to just give you a brief outline of what high frequency ventilation is and how it is going to be, how it is different from a conventional ventilation. So what we're going to talk here about is like basically the principles of high frequency and the clinical application. So the high frequency ventilation is slightly different from a conventional ventilation because in conventional ventilation, you tend to uh, breathe at the rate where the baby is, is breathing, generally between 40 to 60, and there is a positive pressure ventilation breath which opens up the lung and then if the lung deflates to a pressure of P where which is the positive pressure remaining at the end of the expiration and throughout the expiration that is the pressure which is maintained till you the ventilator gives another breath which may or may not synchronize with the baby depending upon what setting or what mode you are using then again it gives a, a positive which inflates the lung again so this is typically with the way we breathe it's like, and that's aided by a ventilator. Whereas the high frequency ventilation, on the other hand, is different because it breathing rate goes from somewhere between 600 to 900 breaths per minute. So this is where the, the whole word calls high and frequency. The frequency is relatively quite high at 600 to 900. And what is so different between the high frequency ventilation and the conventional ventilation is that the 
in the both in conventional and in the high frequency, the inspiration is active because the ventilator is, you know, pushing in air. But in conventional ventilation, the valve opens up to let some part of the pressure go away and sustain. So it is not active, but a passive expiration. Whereas in high frequency, your expiration tends to be not only the inspiration is uh, the active, the expiration is also positive or uh, sorry, is uh, you know active. In the process, there is a higher chances of having hypocapia with the machine when, when you're using high frequency. The other characteristic point would normally we talk a tidal volume, which is like the amount of uh, the air which is going into the alveoli and is responsible for oxygenation. And there is an anatomical dead space, which is the air which is in the upper airways in the in the uh, trachea, but does not involve itself in the gas exchange. So normally, the tidal volume is more than the anatomical dead space, but in high frequency, very small tidal volumes are used. And generally, the delta pre pressures on that uh, the map is generally one to two centimeters higher than the normal variation. So basically, high frequency is a distending pressure where it, you use the pressure to open up the lungs. And then there are oscillations to generate that tidal volume, which we normally do with a delta P in, uh, with, of course, a higher delta P. Suppose you have 16 by 6, you have a 10 delta P. And into the rates would determine the tidal volume, uh, the minute ventilation in the conventional ventilation. Whereas in high frequency, it's just the oscillations which determine the tidal volume. In the first place, people may ask, why do we even need to use the high frequency? Now, high frequency is generally used for two reasons. One, we are not able to oxygenate effectively with a conventional ventilation, where it is known as a rest to ventilation. Others, what we initially did, we started using only for rescue ventilation, but off late, we have started using for primary ventilation, whereas we think that the risk of uh, ventilator-induced lung injury is significantly higher, especially in the very small babies. In those babies, we tend to use elective high frequency to reduce the risk of high uh, ventilation-induced lung injury. And uh, one may wonder, because normally when you hear, we use a peep of around, or a map of 16, 15, 18, on high frequency ventilation, whereas when you use a peep of eight also on conventional ventilator, you tend to get relatively worried. And the reason is this diagram, if you see, because in conventional ventilation, which you see on the right side of the graph, there every pressure gets transmitted to the lowest part of the alveoli. So the more the map, the more the chances there is going to be at a, a barotrauma. Whereas in high frequency, what kind of pressure you give at the opening of the airways, very little gets transmitted down into the lowest part of the alveoli. That's why with the, even with the higher pressure, you do not damage the lung. So again, the principle you would use in using when you're using, you can use go up on the, on the map, unlike the worry you have on the conventional ventilation. But always remember there is a compliance issue, so you should use a uh, tubing which is very thick and rigid and always use the tubing which has been recommended by the manufacturer because if you use uh, some other tubing there is a lot of pressure which gets dissipated in the in the tubing and hence uh, may not produce the desired outcome and you may say hfo has failed but you not use the current kind of uh, setting as well there are multiple mechanisms when we talk about uh, when we talk about how hfo works it works differently from the conventional ventilator. There are like seven mechanisms, but I'm not going to go into the detail. But what I want you to focus on is, uh, again, the oxygenation, the transmission of pressure right at the opening, at the, at the top end. And when it flows to the lower part of the lung, on the left side, you see the alveoli, which is partially closed, gets the larger transmission, whereas the alveoli, which is distended, the transmission of the pressure is lesser. With this, it ensures that the lung does not get damaged. The, the only the, the lung which is not uh, which is not open 
would open with with the with the map which is transmitted through the opening into the alveoli whereas the second alveoli which is shown on the bottom would show that the pressure is lesser compared to the pressure at the opening or at the trachea and when the alveoli open the one you see on the right side there is a diffusion of pressure and once they open they remain open the pressure dissipated with the same kind of a pressure being applied at the opening or a map would be lesser so going very briefly into how do you uh, start you should know the machine and i'll just go back and show you what are the basic uh, things that you would need to uh, plan but before you start the child on on high frequency ventilation remember you need to change to a largest uh, possible tube because smaller the tube more dampening happens and the transmission of pressure becomes lesser so whatever if you're using a child uh, 2.5 size tube change to a 3 size tube if it is possible muscle relaxant we do not use but some people are comfortable using muscle relaxant but personally not my favorite but we do use sedation because it's a different kind of a sedation and most babies are not able to synchronize and to sleep well with the high frequency ventilation so we use some kind of sedation to reduce the discomfort and the pain we suction the baby before putting the baby on the ventilator because one the secretions would dampen the the dissipation of the pressure to the periphery and second if you have to open the lung again and again uh, for suctioning then especially after initiating then it is going to cause a collapse of the lung it is important that you actually avoid uh, suctioning once you starting uh, at least the open suction but disconnecting the ventilator and the baby uh, after you started the initiation you need to have monitoring we're going to come to that but since the hfo involves a high amount of map there could be a slightly decrease intravascular volume or inflow of the fluid into the thorax so you need to correct hypotension with whether you use fluid calcium minor force whatever it is required and always remember if there is a pphn some people may consider using inhaled nitric oxide uh, but for a black lung or a idiopathic pphn maybe hfo is not the best modality so you need to see all pphn does not mean hfo well in india there are different uh, ventilators which are available uh which is the uh, dragger vn500 the sle6000 which most units in india are having this one then some units do use sofi and you know fabian uh the one on the extreme right is the prototype of what is a, a oscillator which is uh, uh, you know sensor medics but sensor medics again the cost of maintaining this ventilator especially with it Uh, of the tubing is high and since it works only as a high frequency so if you're using you want a same ventilator for the conventional needs and the high frequency then probably this is not the ventilator you can choose any one of them on the on the left side so when we look at you need to remember there are three knobs which are important uh one you, you see the 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 amplitude the mean airway pressure and the frequency there is this 33 written this is an i ratio this i am talking of sensor medics but it works the variations are more or less the similar on different uh, you know parameters so so mean airway pressure which is set here on the right on the left side would determine the oxygenation the amplitude would be determining the co2 elimination the frequency and the i ratio which are interdependent would like not which play a little bit role in co2 elimination but this is more to do with the disease process rather than with the co2 elimination and the bias flow in this condition so you can alter the map either with changing the flow or you can set it directly on on some of the ventilators like sle6000 without the need for changing the flow so as i said there are two ways, two reasons why we uh, ventilate one we ventilate for improving the oxygenation and the simplest way is to increase the map and to eliminate the co2 you need to to change the amplitude to increase the amplitude but 
always remember uh, it is not the only determinant. So oxygenation, the MAP, increase in MAP could only help once the lung is recruited enough. Once the lung is open enough, then the oxygen, oxygenation would improve. So if you use a very low MAP, then, and the lung is not recruited, you may say the CO2, the, the lung has not inflated, the, the HFO has failed. But optimize recruitment. On the other hand, remember the amplitude is the driving force, but there are other factors which are machine controlled, like frequency and eye ratio. There is a disease process, which is the baby driven, and the volume guarantee, which is the operator driven. But uh, the SLE 6000 is the one which has a volume guarantee along with HFO. The earlier versions like SLE 5000 or 2000 plus did not have this feature. And the volume guarantee helps to reduce the incidence of excess CO2 washout or hypocarbia, which is responsible for a perimetricular leukomalacia or the brain injury. Now, how to set up the map? So there are two ways to set the map. And as I said, map determines the oxygenation. So you set a high volume strategy or low volume strategy. So you use a map one to two centimeter above the map on the conventional ventilator, or you use one to two centimeters. So you would determine the child is on a map of say 12 on the conventional ventilator. You would want to start at like 13 or 14. So a high volume strategy uh, is, is gone reverse, I think. You know, high volume strategy that a higher map than the conventional ventilator would be required in conditions with a homogeneous lung disease, like a hyaluronic membrane disease or a chemical or infective pneumonitis, like a secondary surfactant deficiency in meconium aspiration syndrome. Whereas some people use a low volume strategy for air leaks or PPH and especially the black lung where the lung parenchyma is not involved, the vasculature is involved in the etiopathogenesis of PPHN. Pulmonary hyperplasia because using a high volume strategy sometimes can lead to pneumothorax and meconium with a predominant gas trapping. Some people use low volume strategy, although conventionally I'm more happy with uh, using a high, a high volume strategy that means recruiting the lung in, in those cases. Other cases can be managed both ways, both on high frequency and on conventional ventilation. So when we say open lung strategy, again, you know, I'm just going to give you only the brief of what is, it is there, there because we'll take another session on a detail once we have a basics a little clear. So if you see this uh, particular uh, diagram on the left, the lung is in, uh, when the lung is de-recruited, so you need a lot of pressure. So if you uh, look at a balloon and balloon, you need a very low, a huge pressure initially to put in, to, to blow the balloon and it opens after a while. Once it's open, you keep on putting more air into that balloon, it distends and goes into a zone of over distension where putting extra amount of air with your lung also does not either burst the balloon or there is very little air you can push because the amount of pressure required is just too huge. But same with the lungs. So you do not want the lung to be in the de-recruited state you don't want the lung to be in over distended state. So you want to work on somewhere in this safe window and you work on the ex the expiration part of this PV loop. So there will be uh, probably another session on how to use an open lung strategy, but you must remember that you need to open up the lung and if you work only in the de-recruited area, you may not see the benefit with the nature flow. So you see, this is typically what happens on a lung. Again, for a sh shortage of time, not showing the details uh, and the video. But uh, if you use a, a tidal volume of 700 ml, this is an adult uh, sheep lung only. So if you see this and use very little peep, there is a lot of damage to the lung and the lung injury. Whereas if you keep the lung open with a little bit of a peep, is high and then with a smaller tidal volume also you're able to give adequate ventilation and keep the lung healthy without the injury so the message what i'm trying to put across is that you would need to open up the lung 
rather than just you working with other parameters, whether it is conventional, whether it is uh, high frequency. For those who are practicing in neonatology, they would have heard about uh, intubation, uh, surfactant and extubate, the insure technique. But what is uh, nowadays being practiced and we are using it in our unit is a recruitment. So we before giving surfactant, we intubate, but first open up the lung with the help where in a homogeneously slightly open lung, the, the distribution of surfactant becomes more homogeneous and it is the b benefits are much more and you're able to come down on pressures relatively faster rather than if you give without recruitment. So in our po policy for a very small babies, we tend to put the, in, uh, ventilate, uh, the intubation and put the tube, to open up the lung, find out about what is the right kind of a pressure which the baby requires, give surfactant and then decrease the pressure. The other thing which we are commonly talked uh, in conventional ventilation is frequency. The frequency we say we increase the rate from 40 to 60, CO2 elimination would increase. So that means you will get more hypocapia. In the conventional, in the high frequency ventilation, it will reverse. So if you increase the frequency, your CO2 elimination would decrease. So that you will have hypercarbia with increasing increase in uh, CO2, uh, sorry, increase in the frequency. So if you decrease the frequency, your CO2 would be, you know, going out much more. So it is complete reverse. Again, without uh, going into detail, just one thing that you need to remember for CO2 elimination, do not touch the frequency, touch the, uh, the amplitude. And if you're touching uh, uh, frequency, it will be reverse of what happens in financial ventilation. So how to set the amplitude? You could look at uh, baby from the side and they should, the, the, because of the high frequency, it should be wobbling a little bit. And wobbling would, should be present in newborns, they say, they should be present at least uh, till the umbilicus, not beyond, because if the wobbling is beyond that, most of the times the children would end up with the hypocapia or low CO2, which may be damaging to the brain. But it is important that you do a blood cast after you've done it, because clinical judgment is, prone to error and children may develop high CO2 washout even with a very minor amplitude, uh, minor uh, wiggling and especially in an edematous baby sometimes it may be difficult to ascertain. So, you know, the other thing is that how do you decide about the frequency? So I'm going straight. So if you have a preterm lung or a very small babies, then in that case you need to use a high frequency. Somewhere like say you have a 700 gram baby and using a ventilator uh, for HFO, somewhere between 12 to 15, depending upon the characteristics of the baby, you can use. But if you have a term baby, like you would probably be more than happy to keep, if I have to give you one number, just keep 12 or 13 for the preterm RDS, 10 for a term uh, uh, lung disease. But if there is a significant traffic, like a meconium aspiration with a gas trapping, use a lower, C, a lower frequency uh, because it helps in, C in CO2 elimination and uh, the oscillations are better transmitted. Similarly, with the cystic PIE, which sometimes can happen uh, as a consequence of a bad HMD, again, uh, where high FI2 and CO2 retention is a problem, then in that case also lower uh, frequency may be better. Again, I just emphasize that you need to use a higher tube because you want the right kind of uh, pressure transmission right up to the uh, to the lower most alveoli. Now, unlike in CMV, it may take 15 to 20 minutes for the lung to show the changes what you have done. So do not make the changes very rapidly. So wait for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour before you change over to the next because the, as I said, little pressure goes into the periphery and to achieve a new equilibrium, it may take some time. When you're weaning the baby from high frequency, just remember, reduce oxygen first, map later. Ideally keep the frequency same because the dynamics of the lung disease will not change unless you have a different pathophysiology coming in the same disease. Some people switch over to CMV. 
you could directly do it. But if you're comfortable, and especially those who are new to uh, high frequency, may switch over to CMV as soon as possible and continue the rest of the ventilation on, uh, on CMV. And uh, we tend to do is like, you know, directly once the baby is who's less than 1,000 grams, a map of 8 NFI to 25%, we can directly uh, extubate from high frequency into the nasal CPAP or nasal NMV, whatever is the preference of the consultant there. When you're monitoring, you may use, free, you may have to have a frequent X-ray, maybe six to 12 hours initially, but then once the baby is settled, the disease process is settled, you could probably wait and get it done based on the clinical judgment. You might use a, need to use an ABG very frequently because of the fact that the CO2 changes happen very uh, rapidly. And especially if the disease process is evolving rapidly, you may need that. Some people use transcutaneous measurement uh, for O2 and CO2, but we don't have the facility. But always, if you possible, put an invasive blood pressure line and always monitor the urine output because when you increase the map, sometimes the intrathoracic pressure goes low and the child may have a drop in uh, blood pressure, hypertension, and consequently, low uh, CO2, uh, low oxygen delivery to the tissue. So you may see the HF is not working because the blood pressure is not maintained properly. So in the last, I want you to remember two or three points where you not to consider high frequency ventilation. Number one, if there is a hypertension, first correct hypertension rather than like, you know, starting with the high, you know, high frequency because the child is not going to improve. Black lung PPHN, which means the X-ray, there are children who have a pulmonary hypertension. You get an X-ray, the X-ray is clear and black, but still the oxygenation is not maintaining. And that is typically a maladaptation where giving higher MAP may actually cause the lung to expand further further reduce the intrathoracic uh, inlet of, uh, of blood and would result in worsening of PPHN rather than helping it. Severe obstructive airway disease may sometimes not work. Although, as I said, if you lower the frequency, sometimes you can work on that, but certainly higher frequencies and higher maps may be counterproductive in these kind of conditions. And if you have a severely inhomogeneous uh, lung disease like meconium aspiration with uh, a lung, uh, air trapping. Sometimes it may not work, but again, you need to understand the pathophysiology and most babies you can ventilate, but for you, if it is a severely inhomogeneous disease, I would suggest that you can just first try with only the, hypo, uh, the homogeneous lung diseases first, like in severe HMD or a severe pneumonia and uh, or a PPHN, which is secondary to a secondary surfactant deficiency where your lung looks bad and white out in those scenarios. And once you're comfortable, then maybe you can try with other modalities also. So in summary, you need to first understand the machine. You need to understand the baby size and also the disease, but it is important to recruit the lung and important to look at the knobs, map oxygenation, amplitude CO2, and frequency is important and follow that uh, table so that you can get the best results of the HFO. Thank you so much. And I end my presentation here and I leave it to Dr. Ramchandra to take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vazir. Uh, well, it, it is an excellent explanation of HFO. Uh, we'll have the question and answer sessions after the uh, next session. In the meantime, I request all the audiences to please type in their questions so that we can have a, a informative question and answer session post the uh, Dr. Ramakrishnan session is over. Over to Dr. Ramakrishnan. Thank you very much. Fantastic session, sir, Dr. Sanjay Vazi, sir. It was very clear and crisp. Thank you. I hope I'll try to match uh, what you have done. Okay. So what... Um, uh, before I start, can you all uh, see my screen? That is number one question. I need a feedback from uh, the organizers. Can you see the screen clearly? Yes, yes, we can. And can you hear my voice clearly? Correct. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank 
the GE team for providing me with this opportunity to speak in front of you. And I wish, you know, if this corona was not there, maybe this talk would uh, would have happened directly at Nepal. And uh, I have not visited Nepal, and uh, I would be very keen to visit in the near future if I am given an opportunity. So thank you all the Nepalese doctors for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll start now. So my topic is on CLAC. Some people call it as CLAC, some call it as CLACO. It doesn't matter. What is CLAC? CLAC is closed loop automated oxygen control. I repeat, closed loop automated oxygen control. Okay. Now, why is this important? Why are we concentrating on this? Now, we all know oxygen is required for survival. And not only in us and in term babies, particularly in preterm neonates with RDS, yes, oxygen saves lives. But similar to what happens in life, too much of something, too much of money is not good, too much of food is not good, and similarly, too much of oxygen is also dangerous. Right. Now, you would have probably heard of lots and lots of studies, uh, you know, uh, just pro prompting or promoting what should be the ideal oxygen saturation that we should aim in uh, preterm babies. What happens if you give too much oxygen? Number one, you know, it, uh, the reactive oxide species are stimulated and then leads to conditions such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia and retinopathy of prematurity. All these happens in uh, uh, preterm babies. So our aim is to minimize these uh, damages uh, by controlling the amount of oxygen that we give. So lots of studies, we have strong evidence to say that we have to target the oxygen supply. We have to target the oxygen delivery. What is targeted oxygen delivery? So targeting the oxygen therapy to maintain the peripheral saturation, right? And you aim for a preterm baby, you aim between 90 to 95%. That's why we have to use the blender and all those things when you are giving just plain oxygen. But um, uh, on a ventilated baby, or either on invasive ventilation or non-invasive ventilation, you aim for your target saturation to be around 90 to 95 percent. And by doing this, you maximize the oxygen delivery to the tissue, at the same time, minimize the risk of complications. Right. So this is the basic concept. Now, how is this achieved in what you know in our daily practice? What happens is the peripheral oxygen saturations are closely monitored by nurses and sometimes by doctors. And these, uh, what happens is if the if a baby is, if you have set the target saturation to be around 91 to 95. And if the baby is saturating at around 99 or 100, the nurse physically brings down the oxygen to uh, bring, bring the target saturation a bit down. But how accurate is this? How easy is this? Can you expect the nurse to do this very perfectly? They are also human beings like us. And uh, it's not always possible to achieve accuracy uh, you know, by t manually targeting the oxygen saturation. And uh, lots of evidence says that preterm babies have approximately 600 mild intermittent hypoxic episodes every week. And imagine a person sitting there and manually adjusting all the, for all these changes. It's going to be very, very tedious, time consuming and complicated. And studies show that only on 20% of the time, the oxygen remains within the, the saturation remains within the target range whenever it's manually controlled, which means a nurse or a doctor, whoever stands there or sits there and adjusts this, they're able to achieve this only on 20% of the time, that is to achieve the target saturation. 
And the more narrower you keep your target saturation, say for example, 90 to 95 seems to be okay. But if you want the saturation to be between 97 to 99, right, and for certain reasons, uh, the more narrower the target range becomes, the compliance of maintaining the target temperature, target target saturation gets even more and more difficult. And the nurse patient ratio, say for example, if, if your NICU is busy and you, you, one nurse is looking after three or four uh, babies, it may be very difficult to maintain manually the target saturation. So what are we going to do? That is the reason why this clack came into existence. Basically, this is like, you know, in those days when we were driving ambassadors, we do everything manually. Nowadays, with your BMW and Audi cars, you set your cruise control, all those things. And with the Tesla cars, you don't even need to hold the steering. You just, just the car takes you from A to B completely programmed. So that is what clack is trying to do. So... This machine, wherever this closed loop uh, automated oxygen control is installed, this machine monitors the saturation of the baby in real time. And then it calculates and adjusts the oxygen without manual intervention. So I'm going to share a small video. Basically, we have the SLV 6000 ventilators and uh, we have installed the Oxygeni the SLE 6000 calls this uh, closed loop automated oxygen control a fancy name which is called as Oxygeni. And this Oxygeni is installed into the SLE 6000 ventilator. And this video will, will tell you what happens. So what happens, you can see the finger pointing out in the video. And that's where the Oxygeni button is, the clack button. And then you switch on, switch that on and the oxygen is turned on and you can confirm it. So it says automatic oxygen and you set your target temperature range. So you set your target temperature range. Here you can see in this instance, it's set to between uh, 94 to 98%, right? And this can be used in conventional in many invasive ventilation, high frequency ventilation, and also in non-invasive ventilation. So what happens is, at the back of the ventilator, you plug one end of your saturation monitor. On the other end of the saturation probe, not the monitor, sorry, the saturation probe, the other end of the saturation probe, you tie it onto the baby. So basically, the saturation readings directly come from the baby to your ventilator display rather than going to your monitor. And this baby has a saturation of 96, 97%, and on the uh, you can adjust the layout, you know, you can change the waveforms, you can switch it on, switch it off. You can do all sorts of uh, simple maneuver on the ventilator screen. And once you set, switch on the waveforms, the bottom waveform is similar to what you see on your uh, monitor, that is your, uh, you know, plethysmograph. And then you also get the signal quality index, the linear lines, which are the signal quality index, right? And then you set the target. So what happens is there is a predefined target. So you can set it between 90 to 94 percent, 94 to 98 percent. You can set it between 91 to 95 percent, or between 92 to 96, or 94 to 98. This all depends on what is your underlying clinical condition, what target range you need. And uh, Averaging time, you know, you, you need to give the machine some time to average, uh, and that is usually set at two to four seconds. And, and then you start this monitoring very easily. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to see the nurses enjoy doing this. It's not complicated. And uh, the oxygen is set. And uh, see here the saturation drops, and the oxygen requirement goes up to 61% on the right co bottom column. So this is the... And you, you can change the screen. It can give you the trend for what is happening over the past two hours, uh, 120 minutes, 60 minutes. It gives you the target oxygen range and also the reference oxygen, oxygen uh, that's been given, right? So, and you can also have other waveforms like your flow waveform, waveform along with that so that you can compare what's happening 
uh, in this uh, screen. So it's quite a handy device. And how does it work? So I'm not going to take you back into your mathematics because uh, uh, we all have a little bit far away from mathematics when we are practicing science. Unfortunately, these machines use some mathematics and physics. Uh, so these machines, you know, the uh, closed loop oxygen automated control uses algorithms. Basically, they are rule based algorithms, which I'm not going to detail. And then the SLE 6000 uses this proportional integral differential algorithm. It's called as PID algorithm. Again, not going into details. And the third one is the adaptive model algorithm. Now, each algorithm calculates the saturation it has analyzes the saturation uh, input from the baby and it decides how much oxygen the baby needs depending on the input so uh, so basically it continuously adjusts the oxygen uh, uh, supply to match your target saturation and there is good uh, evidence to say that uh, you know, when compared to manual uh, method of uh, oxygen administration, uh, these algorithms are better. Uh, anywhere between 50 to 60 percent is uh, uh, achieving the target range. You know, percentage of time achieving the target range of oxygen saturation. So any algorithm you can go for, which is good. And currently, the SLE 6000 uses the last one, the PID algorithm. Just remember that. Now, what is the accuracy of this closed loop automated oxygen control? How can we rely this? Can we, can you, will you be able to happily sit on a Tesla car and let the car drive you from A to B without touching the steering? That is the question everyone of us asks. Now, for that, there is evidence. And um, what, um, there, 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 are, there were 16 uh, single and multi center studies that were published. And they compared the closed loop automated oxygen control to manual automated oxygen, manual control by a nurse. Now, when you, when you come to manual control, you should have an optimal manual control or an ideal manual control, which means one is to one ratio. So you basically employ a nurse to sit by the side of the baby and then set the target range of oxygen saturation and ask the nurse to adjust the uh, oxygen requirement, you know, the FiO2, depending on the baby's requirement. Say you set the target range between 90 to 95, and the nurse sits there and adjusts very religiously, very meticulously, and that manual control was compared with the closed loop automated control, oxygen control. So what happens? So on 81% of the time, the closed loop automated control maintained the saturation within the target range between 91 to 95%. Whereas one-to-one -one nurse is able to maintain the target saturation only 69% of the time. So definitely it's significant. And the second thing is in preterm babies with non-invasive ventilation, again, the clack maintains the oxygen saturation within the target range on 78% of the time. Whereas the nurse is able to do that only 55% of the time. And this is statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.005. And not only this, hyperoxic events, you know, our main aim is to prevent more oxygen being given to the baby. And the clack, say, 98%, uh, 99%, we don't want the baby to receive. So the clack, uh, you know, one, uh, during a 90-minute minute period, there were only 4.3 episodes of uh, increased oxygen delivered to the baby, whereas when the nurse does it, there were 9.3 episodes during that 90-minute period. And uh, the duration of these hypoxic events, then when the nurse did it, controlled it, the hyperoxic events, the more oxygen received by, by the baby, went on for about 19.3 seconds. Whereas uh, with this closed loop automated control, the, uh, the, the oxygen uh, went above the target range 
uh, only for about 10 seconds uh, uh, during that 90-minute period. On the median time, percentage of time spent, uh, more than 95% was significantly less in the closed-loop automated control uh, at 19% compared to 42% when it was done manually. What happens, you, we will be worried whether the machine would miss extreme hypoxia. Would the machine not pick up 75% saturation or 80% saturation? Fortunately, there was no difference and the machine was found to be safe when compared to the manual. Uh, because definitely human beings uh, uh, react quickly uh, when it comes to hypoxia. Uh, and similarly, the machine also uh, was, uh, uh, you know, almost equal to human beings and, uh, and it was even better. So what happens to the staff nurse's time, right? Uh, when, you, when you employ the closed-loop automated oxygen control system, the nurse has to uh, adjust only occasionally, whereas in the manual system, the nurse has to adjust the FIO to 29 times per hour. Whereas in the, in the automated system, the machine took care of most of the time, but only on one occasion she had to come and adjust uh, the oxygen uh, supply. So definitely it reduces the workload of the nurses, and the nurses will be happy uh, when something else automatic takes care of their work, and they, they have some time to do other works like taking care of the baby. Now, what is the performance of this closed-loop automated control system under different conditions. Say, what happens at various different postnatal age, ages? And uh, it has been proven that uh, this uh, track works on uh, day one, day two, day three, day five, any, any, any day of the age. So you can use it reliably in preterm babies who are uh, uh, 30 days old or 120 days old. That doesn't matter. And it works in intubated babies and ventilated babies. It works in conventional ventilation, high-frequency ventilation, and also in uh, heated, humidified, high-flow nasal cannula oxygen, non-invasive ventilation everywhere. So this works in all the modes of ventilation. Unfortunately, there are still no studies on term newborn infants. So if somebody wants to work on that, that's a good area for research. So term newborn infants, you know, we, we plan to look into it, what's happening to the oxygen in uh, term newborn infants. And what happens to the other outcomes? Now, when, whenever a baby is in, when we are weaning the oxygen, what happens is, you know, we are a uh, bit uh, scared to wean the oxygen. Say, for example, during the night time, the consultants say, okay, stop weaning the oxygen tonight, we'll wean the oxygen tomorrow morning. Because they don't want to get a call at two o'clock in the morning saying that this baby is hypoxic, right? So whereas we, when you leave it to the automated system, it doesn't care whether your consultant is awake at two o'clock or three o'clock. It, um, it maintains the target saturation. And uh, what people have found is, uh, you know, on some studies, the babies were weaned from oxygen earlier than the manual control. However, Dr. we need more studies. Sorry? Dr. Ramakrishnan, Mandeep here. Uh, I think your slides are not uh, moving along. Can you are change it? Where, where, where is it stuck now? It is on comparison of algorithms. Comparison of what? Algorithms. Oh, it's, it's still stuck there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. All right, I've come. I've come a long way then. Uh, so it's here, is it? It's stuck here. Hello. It is at comparisons of the slide which is showing is comparison of algorithm. So it's it's stuck here, is it? Yes, it okay. is. Okay. So the algorithms I told you that uh, they were basically. Uh, they were able to maintain 50 to 60 percent of the target time uh, achieved. Is the slide moving now? No, it is on the same uh, page. How come? Uh, because the internet signal is good. Uh, my video is good. So what is happening to the slides? Uh, shall I 
pause, uh, stop the sharing. You can stop you sharing once and you can reshare your slide again. Yeah, sure. I'll do that, yeah. And then can you can move forward. Okay, can you see the screen now? Can you see the screen? No, I'm able to see you. Uh, it says the screen is sharing. Uh, you are crying. It says you are sharing the screen, and uh, so I'm not sure why you are why you are not able to see. Um, can you see the screen now? No, actually, I'm only able to see your uh, you on the screen, not the presentation. Okay. So, in that case, what I'll do, I'll see if I can turn the um, It doesn't work, right? No. Right. If you give me two minutes, what I'll do, I can send my presentation uh, on PowerPoint to you. Would you be able to load that? That's right. We can do that. Okay. One second. I will remove the video so that uh, the PowerPoint uh, loads easily. I'm sorry for this uh, inconvenience. Yeah, you, you can uh, send the presentation to us. Meantime, I can uh, at least uh, take up the Maybe questions can... which have come. Yes, that's a good idea. And who should I share it to? Yeah. Uh, shall I send it by email or something? Yeah, you can send it by email to Arpitanti. Okay, Arpita, okay. PowerPoint. So, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think uh, we should also carry on with the questions. Uh, so. Yeah, carry on, yeah, please. Yeah, so in the interest of time, I will start with the first question. Uh, the first question for uh, Dr. Vazir is uh, Dr. Raidam Basnet from Kathmandu Medical College. Uh, he has asked the first question, what should be the strategy of ventilation in PIE, pulmonary instant tracheal and emphysema? So this is the first question from him. So you would like to hear all the questions and then answer or I should uh, stop after yeah, the you, question? You can go ahead and, and ask all the questions then probably, you know, without interruption, I can tell. Okay. What is the use of HFOV and prevention of BPD? This is the second question. Correct. You go and ask all the questions we can... First question is, sir, can we use HFO, HFO philosophy, uh, uh, HFO philo, philoptically in... Uh, Three term even at a lower MAP, that is eight to nine. Sorry, can I can I have the question again? I didn't get that one. Just a minute. Yeah, so the question is can we use HFO? That is P H O P H Y L A C T I C A L L Y phyloptically in preterm even at lower MAP, that is eight to nine. I think this must be meaning prophylactically. Yeah, prophylactically. It's, I think the spec okay. is wrong, so it is phyloptically is coming. Okay. So these are the three questions. The one more question which I've got from Dr. Imran Mohammed, it is role of DC, DC O2. Okay. So uh, the first question about, uh, you know, should we use HFO in the prophylactic, uh, prophylactically in smaller babies? And uh, yes, that's what I said. It's not a prophylactic use. It's an elective use in some babies that you tend to use. 
uh, in a smaller babies you can use especially in hmd you use a, a you know high frequency right at the beginning and that is what is a practice which is some of the european countries especially in netherlands dr van kam reisen burger they use but 8 to 9 may be just too low because if the child needs a high frequency and needs uh, then he probably needs a little uh, higher map but that what higher is based on an open lung strategy as i already mentioned earlier that we need to open the lung whether it takes 8 whether it takes 12 whether it is 15 to open up the lung you need to open up the lung and keep it open at all the time so that you can actually ventilate at the optimum meet and in that safe window which i showed so it's not 8 or 9 or 10 it is what opens up the lung that you need to ventilate in that range rather than uh, fixing up a fixed time then as, as you said hfo can it reduce a bpd at the at the current moment there is no evidence to suggest that uh, hfo is better than other modalities in fact earlier there were a concern about hfo increasing the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage the neurological outcome was worsening because of higher incidence of uh, B, uh, hypocapia but uh, there is no trial which has compared hfo with a volume guarantee uh, cm uh, this uh, ptv ventilation so now people are using volume guarantee instead of the earlier used pressure targeted uh, ventilation and uh, and there is no trial which has compared hfo with volume guarantee with the volume targeted ventilation so as of now it is more most people are using as for as a rescue ventilation rather than as a primary ventilation but if you ask the question is there evidence that bpt is reduced with an hfo and the answer is no as of now the third question was uh, whether uh, what is the volume and the ventilation strategy in pie now as i said there is no definitive management of pie that but the idea is to increase the gas exchange and the minimize the risk of further air leaks so you, you want to use uh, the problem is the oxygenation is not getting maintained and there is a significant air trapping mainly in the interstitium and this you can achieve the ventilation can be achieved by using a slightly lower peak inspiratory pressure can you hear me now hello yeah i can we can yeah so the idea is to reduce the mean uh, the peak inspiratory pressure reduce the peep also as you know and the ti okay in that in those scenarios that will reduce the map and which when, when i uh, talk in terms of conventional ventilation in a lower uh, as i said low volume strategy in map would also work in in those babies with pi but you want to use a lower frequency somewhere around maybe six seven or uh, and then this should be the the fi2 needs to be high to compensate for the lower map and uh, to avoid large cyclic uh, swings in the tidal volume it is important that you actually use a high frequency in this setting if the available is if uh, the ventilator is available although again if you ask me is there any evidence for this no there are no trials which are compared high frequency ventilation versus conventional ventilation with the strategy which i discussed but since most places would have only a conventional reduce peep reduce peep and ti and in, increase the fi2 in addition if it is a unilateral pi that is mainly on one side not on the other side then positioning the infant with the affected side down and uh, can actually also help in uh, decreasing uh, uh, you know the impact of the pi Placing the infant in the lateral decubitus actually promotes the aeration of the unaffected lung and reduces the aeration of the lung with the PI. And the last question was about the DCO2. DCO2 is diffusion co coefficient of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, CO2, but this is not same as a, as a PCO2. This is a mathematical value, which is based on, on a computation of and it's a mathematical based on the on the value of the tidal volume which is there on the ventilator and the the frequency so you how you use it in clinical practice is that you for example you start a ventilation 
and you see a DCO2 value of, say, 100, you know, hypothetically, and uh, you find a CO2 of 40. Now, DCO2 and PCO2 work in opposite direction. So if your DCO2 now increases, that means you're going into hypocapnia. It again, there is no direct correlation. So it's not a linear correlation between DCO2 and PCO2. PCO2 is something you see on a blood gas in the in the uh, on on a CO2 estimation. DCO2 again is a mathematical value because I said in high frequency uh, tidal volume and frequency are the two determinants of oxygenation. So if your DCO2 changes towards upside then you probably are going, CO2 is going lower, but you still need to confirm it with a blood gas. It gives you an idea that probably the drug lung disease is improving. You need to change your strategy. But beyond that, no direct correlation that value suggests any particular value of the PCO2. Uh, Hello? Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, I think I'll answer for the question. I the technical glitch we were having, and uh, I think the presentation is also getting better. We are on the same page, comparison of algorithms, and I'll ask or request Dr. Ramakrishnan to uh, take charge again. Okay. So, you know, the, the these uh, closed-loop oxygen control uses three al algorithms. Hello? Hello, can you hear now? We can hear, sir. We can hear. You can go ahead. Okay, that's fine. Right. So all, you know, three algorithms um, are basically used, and uh, uh, all these three algorithms were uh, good, good enough, and they maintain the target saturation within the range around 50 to 60 percent of the time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Can you press enter again? Yeah. So 52 to 60 percent. That's fine. Next, please. Next. So the accuracy of CLAC. What happens is 16 single or multi-central trial studies were uh, completed and they're available. Uh, press enter. Next. Um, okay. So what happens is when compared to the manual control, uh, which was achieved by a nurse, you know, one is to one nurse. The CLAC maintained the saturation within the target range 81% of the time, whereas uh, with the best one is to one nurse control, the nurse was able to maintain the target saturation only 69% of the time. And similarly, in preterm non invasive ventilation, 78% of the time, the CLAC was able to maintain the saturation within the target range. Uh, whereas the the uh, the nurse was able to maintain uh, only around 55% of the time, and this was statistically significant. Next slide, please. Okay, and even the hyperoxic events were less in the uh, clack when compared to the manual. So 4.3 episodes per 90 minutes whereas uh, uh, hyperoxic events were more with the manual 9.3 episodes uh, during that 90 minute period. On the duration of the time the child spent uh, uh, receiving high oxygen or high saturation was 10 seconds, which is significantly less when compared to the manual uh, control of about 19 seconds. Um, on the median time spent on saturation more than 95%, was significantly less with this automated system when compared to the uh, manual system. Unfortunately, even the extreme events like hypoxia, because we as neonatologists, we would be worried more about uh, hypoxia. And uh, both uh, the nurses and the automated system did not allow significant hypoxia below 75 or 80 to uh, develop during that 90 minute period. Next slide, please. So not only this, the, they also found out that the nurse had to adjust the saturation, the FiO2, only once per hour during that uh, period, whereas with manual control, the nurse has to, had to adjust the uh, FiO2 29 times per hour, which is quite significant. Next slide, please. So 
what is the use of the CLAC under what does how does CLAC perform under different uh, conditions? And uh, CLAC works fantastic in at different postnatal ages. So you can use it on day one, day three, day five, or day eighty. So a preterm baby, you can use it on day thirty or day sixty. It doesn't matter. It works well on intubated and ventilated babies, both on conventional and high frequency ventilation. You can use it. It works on non-invasive ventilation. Also, it works. Uh, however, no studies were done on term babies. So, if somebody is interested in doing some research uh, with Oxygeni, term babies you can focus on. Um, next slide, please. On the other outcomes, what happens? See, when when physicians uh, try to wean oxygen, they don't. Uh, they are not bold enough to wean oxygen during the night time because. The consultants don't want to be disturbed during the night, whereas the machine doesn't know that. And uh, the, they found out that uh, some studies uh, showed that uh, by using closed-loop automated oxygen system, the babies were weaned faster and they were able to come out of oxygen faster. And there were also no adverse ref effects reported uh, using the uh, closed-loop oxygen system. Uh, next, please. And. Uh, even if sometimes if the, sometimes what happens is if the signal quality is poor and if the automated system doesn't increase oxygen quickly, there is an option to override that and you can manually increase it if you're worried about your baby. So still manual override uh, exists. And there is currently a large multi-center trial. Currently no one has looked at uh, the effect of the, the, the effect of uh, uh, tightly maintaining the oxygen saturation and long-term outcomes with the help of a uh, closed-loop automated uh, oxygen system. So there is a large multi-center trial that is ongoing now, and you will be getting the results in 2022. Next slide, please. So the take-home message is CLAC increases the percentage of time saturations are uh, maintained within the target range. Next reduces the number of manual modifications. Next. However, when the babies move, it disrupts the signal. And uh, there has been theoretical concerns that there may be a delay in response to hypoxemia. And uh, the other danger is sometimes, you know, preterm babies, you know, when you're doing the ward rounds, the nurses will say that the babies are having more desaturation than yesterday. So you assess that the babies are thicker when compared to yesterday. But with this closed loop system, there is a danger that this machine automatically keeps adjusting the oxygen. And you may not be able to identify true desaturations. But in those situations, you have to just overall assess the trend and see how much, how low the oxygen saturation has gone. So which will give you a clue. And also the clinicians to focus on the concentration of oxygen, you know, they concentrate on the fraction of the inspired oxygen during the water rounds. So don't look, just look at the saturation and, do, uh, and ignore the FiO2 because sometimes the clack will constantly automatically adjust and sometimes the babies will be uh, on more oxygen than more FiO2 requirement, which indicates that the child is worsening. Next slide, please. Still more work needs to be done because currently the CLAC is achieving only 70 to 80 percent perfection. So one would expect 100 percent perfection. I think the algorithms are on the mend every day. And I think uh, in the future, when more and more of us start using the CLAC, there will be more data going back as a feedback, and these systems will get better and better every day as we use more and more. Thank you very much for uh, your time, and sorry for the inter inter interruption in the middle. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was indeed a wonderful session. Uh, there are a few Thanks. questions you as well. Uh, I'll yeah. start you all the questions at one go, or we should start with one by one? One by one, please. Yeah, so the first question is from Dr. Sharad Chandran. His question is, uh -huh. will there be any alarm or some beep to indicate that higher FiO2 is being delivered to maintain the target SpO2? Yes, if the... If the Say, you know, each uh, machine has different uh, algorithms. You know, there are, it's not only SLD 6000 that uh, provides this CLAC, but also other ventilators, there are a few. Uh, and each one, you know, some uh, ventilators, if the oxygen requirement goes above 
five percent or ten uh, percent, you know, the uh, the alarm, uh, the, the the ventilator will blink and give you an alarm. And there are ventilators where you can set up, you know, you can decide beyond what percentage if the uh, if the oxygen requirement goes up, you would want the ventilator to alarm. So those sort of flexibilities are coming up now. So yes, certainly yes, that's a good question. And uh, yes, there are alarms. Yeah, the second question is, sir, from Dr. M. Venkatesh. After using plan, did the ROP incidents came down? Good question. Again, now, as these new technologies, you know, we have been having it only for the past uh, few months now. And uh, maybe next year when I, when I present my data, you know, we are trying to gather as much data as possible from, from the CLAC. And I may be able to provide my own unit's experience when I come to Nepal and spend time with you guys next year. Did I move to the next question? Yeah. Yeah. So the third question is from Dr. Dhinkar Sitharaman. Can we use oxygen in all the units or do we have any disease or pathological condition contraindicated? Now, uh, as I told you, there are not many studies uh, outside the preterm range, uh, you know, using oxygen uh, outside the preterm uh, gestation. But, um, you know, I am planning to do a study on uh, term babies with meconium aspiration, and I am planning to keep the saturation uh, target, say, around uh, 97 to 100 or 96 to 100. And uh, again, I may be able to publish uh, our data to see whether there is any problem with this next year. Next, in, in the next one or two years, that's number one. And again, uh, sometimes in uh, you know the, the, the set default in these uh, are usually from uh, 891 to 95, you know, 90, 89 to 93. I don't see any default, uh, any ranges below that. Particularly in congenital cardiac disease, maybe if you want, if you don't want the saturation to be above 90 percent, if you are happy for the saturation to be 80 to 85 percent in babies like, uh, uh, you know, a mixed cyanotic heart disease. Uh, in those situations, this CLAC cannot be used at the moment because uh, uh, there is no uh, range that has been programmed into this. But I think future studies will uh, definitely guide us more on, uh, on that area. So thank you. That's a good question as well. Next question, please. Yeah. 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 So the next question is from Dr. Imran Muhammad. Whether CLAC also detects movements of artifacts adjusts FiO2 accordingly? Yes. Again, these clever algorithms, again, that's a good question. These clever algorithms, um, they look at the movement artifacts, they look at the signal quality index, and also the plethysmography, and then if the plethysmography or the signal quality index is not good or if the uh, movement artifacts are too much, it continues to give same oxygen, uh, FiO2, that the baby has required on average over the past 90 minutes or 120 minutes. Say, for example, if the baby had required 60% in the past um, 90 minutes, and only in the last 10, 15 minutes, the baby's oxygen requirement had come down to 50%. But if there is a problem with the signal quality, until the signal normalizes, the CLAC would uh, give you uh, the higher percentage, you know, the, the average which has been going on for the past one hour or so, rather than the current uh, uh, improper signal uh, quality uh, you know, uh, saturation target. So, yes, it's, it's a clever machine and uh, definitely there are safety mechanisms built into it. Next question, please. Yeah. So, there is, this is the last question, sir, uh, for yeah. you. Yeah. So, basically, this is a question from Dr. Raidam Basnet, lecturer at Kathmandu Medical College. This question is, uh -huh. in your unit, what is the definition of desaturations in preterm? In your unit, Will it mask desaturations that frequently so that it affects the point of stoppage in caffeine? Right. Now, desaturations, again, um, what, see, there, there is a theoretical risk that uh, desaturations um, 
will be masked by this flow slope oxygen uh, system particularly if uh, you know if nurses uh, are uh, documenting and telling you in the ward round that uh, you know when compared to yesterday today's desaturations are more uh, so definitely there is a theoretical risk but what we do have is uh, on top of the class we also have you know our monitors are all centralized and i can you know i get the the entire data every second data from the monitor onto my paperless uh, software which i have developed and uh, what i get is i get the highest saturation the lowest saturation the um, the interquartile range and the median saturation and all those things and so during the ward rounds or whenever i have a suspicion uh, you know rather than looking at the paper notes uh, written by the nurses which we are going away from it now i would rather look into the trend and depending on what has been happened you know there is no specific cut off for desaturation because each baby is different so i look at the same baby when compared to few days before whether there is any change or improvement and based on the trend i base my clinical decision rather than uh, uh, taking a knee jerk reaction on a fixed number yeah so thank you so uh, in the meantime also received few questions for dr wazir again uh dr wazir i do you have uh, you have muted your video can you just uh, reconnect once yeah yeah i'm here i was muted yeah 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 so basically sir uh, there is a question what are the clinical conditions for deciding hfo and the second question is is there any benefit for a high end conventional ventilator having hfo integrated versus a stand alone only hfo okay uh, so one the first question is that uh, what are the clinical conditions where you would probably consider using hfo and i mentioned in my talk so we generally use where we fail conventional ventilation and that is the most common reason for people to move from conventional ventilation because it's not working and they need to use some alternate may, way of uh, you know ventilating the child and getting the oxygen in and most common is a severe hmd for example the severe meconium aspiration with a secondary surfactant deficiency or a severe pneumonia and sometimes the pph is secondary to a parenchymal lung disease air leaks is one other condition where probably you know using conventional ventilation may uh, not be as useful and sometimes the air trapping is significant and you co2 retention is significant on conventional ventilation and then you use so basically one use is as a rescue ventilation where you are not getting optimum oxygenation and the other use is in elective very small babies you use as an elective ventilation which some people use we also use in very small babies but at the same time i would suggest that for the beginners you should restrict it to use in conventional ventilation failure cases only second is that you we said whether you want to use an hf alone and that is the sensor medics that you need to see one of the most powerful ventilator oscillators which can be used in you know babies from 500 grams to bigger babies also uh versus you use a ventilator which is a combined mix now since you have a tendency for people to use non invasive ventilation very commonly and most babies in an era of of conventional ventilation uh, in the era of antenatal steroids and uh, surfactant you know can move on to a uh, non invasive ventilation very fast so i would probably prefer in my preference would be to have a ventilator you have all the modes where you do not have to use the ventilator circuit you don't have to move the baby from one ventilator to the other in that scenario my preference would be a ventilator where all modes are available from invasive non as a sort of high frequency conventional and non invasive whereas some people who are old school still want to practice conventional ventilator with sensor medics and they're happy with the results yes that's an option but it's an expensive proposition and uh, you tend to you know change baby from one ventilator to other which could be traumatizing in very small babies thank you sir uh, so i have received one more question 
how effective is BiPAP in Unix compared to HFC and CPAP? So, practically speaking, I do not have a significant uh, experience with the BiPAP, but uh, what we use is in, uh, in a nasal in, uh, intermittent ventilation. And uh, of course, when we compare HFNC versus CPAP, the advantages for a primary mode of ventilation, there is a significant evidence which suggests that for a primary lung disease, like an RDS in a very small baby, CPAP may be superior than HFNC in less than 28 weeks. BiPAP advantage, theoretically, it seems fine that it works better, but, uh, you know, as of now, I don't remember any evidence suggesting that BiPAP is better than CPAP in primary lung disease. And uh, nasal intermittent non-synchronized or synchronized ventilation is something which people are trying, and we use non-synchronized method uh, of, of nasal IMB, and we find that uh, failure rate with C is slightly better than CPAP, but uh, it's like, you know, better with CPAP, and then like, you know, there are people who would be comfortable with CPAP, so I would not have much to choose between a non-synchronized uh, NIV versus a CPAP, but synchronized I I am, uh, nasal uh, IMV or nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation through the nasal route, synchronized version would possibly be a better strategy than CPAP in some of the cases. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. And I'll just take the last question for Dr. Ramakrishnan and then we'll call up for the day. Uh, yeah. This is Dr. Nathu, plaque will increase only if I in volume target ventilation is safe. How safe when using NIV or HHHFNC? Sorry, repeat the question again. Yeah, so I'm repeating the question again. Clack will increase FiO2. In volume target ventilation, is it safe? How safe when used in NIV or triple H FNC? Okay, good. Again, that's a good question. And your question has been addressed in a uh, few of the studies. Uh, because, uh, uh, it, it, you know, this, this closed loop automated oxygen delivery works uh, uh, separately based on the baby saturation, right? So it works with any mode of ventilation, conventional ventilation, volume targeted ventilation, and non-invasive ventilation, heated humidified high flow uh, nasal cannula oxygen, triple H, SNC. So it has been proven that it, it is uh, better than the manual uh, controlled oxygen uh, in any of these modes of uh, ventilation, particularly in preterm babies. So it is certainly safe and can be used with confidence because algorithms have been time tested and they, it has gone through lots of modifications and uh, it's, it's, uh, unless it's safe, safe, it will not be uh, implemented into, I have used this, uh, 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 you know, at King's College London, they use it, and in, in bigger centers, where um, without proving that it's safe, you know, it will not be implemented in the UK NHS hospital. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, with, I you. think we have completed all the set of questions that were being asked by all the doctors across the webinar. Uh, so I'll thank both of you uh, for this wonderful uh, informative sessions uh, for uh, both B and uh, Nepal. Uh, pediatric society as well as the people who have joined across the country from india as well i'll close this uh session hereby and just with a quote that life is all about giving time spend more time on what we want to know and today we have given that on what we wanted to know so i think this is very very okay. from all of you and thank you so much have a great great day ahead thank you thank you thank you very much for uh, organizing this and it's fantastic thank you Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.